You have to ask yourself the question, I'm investing an enormous amount of resource to maintain a crew up in space. Now what they can provide is a real-time analysis of the targets. They can look at something and they can say, well, this is something interesting and we should be able to, we should find out more about this. But is it worth that amount of resources to have a crew just tell you that? The mole program to put human beings in orbit was going to cost more money because everything had to be man-rated. There had to be safety features. It's extra weight. It means the vehicle has to be bigger. It has to have more fuel. It, it just adds cost everywhere along the line. MOL was a very expensive program. It seems like chicken feed today it was a, th I think it was a $3 billion program. But in the 1960s, that was a lot of money. Think back in the mid to late 60s, Johnson was the president. He was trying to fund all the Great Society programs. He was trying to fund the expansion of the war in Vietnam. He was trying to fund going to the moon on Apollo. And, and here we were. And we would take a cut basically every year. And we used to jokingly tell ourselves that the only thing that remained constant on the program was the number of days till the first launch. The scheduled launch date for the first mole mission was August 1970. The Russians planned to launch Almaz that April to commemorate Lenin's 100th birthday. But in November 1966, the Americans seemed poised to make a huge leap forward. At Cape Canaveral, a unique rocket configuration was rolled out to the launch pad. Atop the standard Titan 3C solid rocket boosters was a hollow mock-up of the Mole Laboratory. And atop that, workers attached an unmanned Gemini B capsule. Designers needed to test whether the Gemini's heat shield would still work after the Mole's access hatch had been cut into it. Unlike most NASA launches, there were no astronauts on display. You know, the NASA astronauts back in the 60s were all good friends of, of ours. We knew them all. We went to Houston, and when we went to Houston, they'd tell us all about what they were doing, and we wouldn't tell them anything about what we were doing. Yeah, we were different, that's all. We, we, you know, we weren't on the cover of Life magazine. We weren't driving Corvettes. We were, you know, just doing different things. At 8.50 on November 3rd, the mole program literally got off the ground. Just over 100 miles in space, the unmanned capsule was ejected. U.S. Navy ships recovered it 5,500 miles out in the Atlantic. The capsule was intact and proved that pilots could survive re-entry. But surviving their training program was another question. Major Robert Lawrence was one of the final crew members chosen for Mole. He was one of the Air Force's best pilots. He had a PhD in chemistry, and he was the first African-American selected to be an astronaut. Bob was such an excellent pilot that the idea of him having an accident really had never entered my mind. They were doing a simulated shuttle approach in an F-104, which was a very difficult maneuver. I think Harv Royer was flying the airplane, and he just misjudged a second or two, and, and that's, that's all you had. And I think they got uh, too low, pulled out too late, uh, actually hit the ground hard, bounced in the air, and as I understand, the airplane rolled. And Horia managed to, they both ejected. Horia survived the ejection and Bob didn't. I was standing at home changing the buttons on a dress, and I looked out the window and saw Bob Harris coming up the walk. I thought, I don't have to ask. 
I guess it's what they call a life-changing experience, you know. You, suddenly, you know, in the morning everything seems okay, and then a few minutes later uh, it's all over. That morning I wanted to change his flight and wanted me to fly in, in his place on that particular flight. That's about all there is to say. I should have been in the back seat of that airplane instead of him. The accident served to make us realize that uh, we really were a very small group and we had a big problem. Uh, and that meant lots of training uh, and that uh, we uh, expanded our efforts and increased our efforts. By the beginning of 1969, the secret race between Russia and the U.S. to launch the first spies into space seemed to be neck and neck. Both sides had made significant advances, but they were both years behind schedule. We thought that in the coming year or two, we would be able to launch the space station into orbit. Still, our program fell behind by three years. For the first time, I know I personally was beginning to believe, I believe this can work. Well, some of them might have been a bit worried about what the Russians were doing at this point. What they really didn't know was that the competition was less with the Russians than it was within their own government. Right around the corner from them, it was another agency called the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office. The National Reconnaissance Office was extremely secret during the 1960s. Matter of fact, even its name wasn't declassified until the early 90s. Their job was to, was to try to find a, a way to put satellites up there that could get the very same resolution. They were going to develop a competitive system and the CIA backed that. Larry Skantz, who had worked at NRO and later helped plan Mole, was one of the few people with a security clearance for both programs. Both systems were aimed at developing three-inch technical resolution. From a technical point of view, they kind of wound up in a dead heat. We were aware that there were unmanned reconnaissance satellites with truly impressive capability on the drawing board. You know, there's the unmanned guys that said, you know, we don't need you, and then there's the manned guys that say, well, you can't live without us. It was obvious to me the first time I went to a place where the unmanned system was being run, they didn't want any part of us. And somebody m bigger than them told them to let us in to see it. Unknown to the mole crew, the Secretary of the Air Force went to the White House to make a last-minute plea to President Nixon. And the mole's future hung in the balance. For Hank Hartsfield, the morning of Tuesday, June 10th, 1969, was like any other. I uh, jumped in my little MG, and as usual, I had a little plug in my ear to listen to the local news, and uh, was happily driving down 405. They came in with an announcement. This morning, the manned orbiting laboratory has been canceled by the Department of Defense. Holy cow, what's, what's going on here? And there were two news stations. I switched to the other one to see if the story would be any different, and <laughs> it wasn't. I was in a meeting arguing with an engineer, and I felt this tap on my shoulder, and I looked around, and it, it was Mac. And I looked in his eyes, and, and he said, real low. Nobody else in the room heard him. He said, the program's canceled. And I turned around to this engineer that I was arguing with, and I, I, my mind was blank. I didn't know what we'd been talking about. What happens to the 14 astronauts now who've been training for lengthy missions? Well, they'll find, I'm sure, uh, appropriate assignments elsewhere. They're a very good uh, bunch of boys, and I'm sure...